In this lesson, we're going to learn all about tracheostomies. Now, usually it's this semester where you learn about tracheostomies because you will be certain there are tracheostomy type questions on your fundamentals final exam. However, your hands-on experience for tracheostomy care will come when you are in your next semester. So for now, this is a little bit of a introduction to how to take care of a patient who has a tracheostomy. So who has seen these up close and personal? Hmm? How do you feel about caring for a patient who has one of these? I'll be honest, I was pretty darn intimidated knowing that this was their airway and there's a lot of do's and don'ts when you have a tracheostomy. So why does someone need to have one of these? Let's look at a couple different reasons why your patient might need a tracheostomy. Our first reason is uh, maybe a congenital deformity such as tracheomalacia. Maybe a patient uh, is premature and therefore the cartilage is not strong enough to stand open all by itself. So this little preemie here will actually need one, but congenital deformities is a reason. Our next reason is obstruction from say, laryngeal trauma or laryngeal cancer. Here would actually be identified as a tumor in the upper airway. Another reason we may need uh, to have a tracheostomy is because of edema in the airway. Wait, this guy just has black on his face. What, why are we giving you know, him a tracheostomy? What he actually has here is smoke inhalation from a uh, explosion that happened close to his face and breathing in those chemicals is gonna cause a lot of edema in his upper airway and his throat area. And so he may be a candidate for uh, either endotracheal uh, intubation or a tracheostomy. This next case is a patient who has um, experience an anaphylactic reaction. And so as you can see, she has what we call um, angioedema or edema uh, in the face and in the airway. So as you look, her tongue is quite swollen and it is so swollen to a point where it's going to obstruct any air she is trying to take in. This right here are a collection of pictures for patients who have the tendency to uh, experience sleep apnea, right? Sleep apnea. And oftentimes we can place our patients on CPAP machines so they can sleep at night, not have any airway obstructions, but it can be to a degree where it's so severe that patients are not able to support their airways at all. And this is a case right here because uh, he doesn't have enough of a chin base to be able to hold his um, mouth open while he sleeps. This is just kind of an, an example of how tongue, the tongue can actually obstruct the airway because it falls backward. And our patients who are morbidly obese and if they have a heavy neck burden, then oftentimes their airways, as we quote unquote say, their airways collapse on themselves. Get these out of the way. You and you and you. Well, you'll be fine. Okay. Another reason we may need a tracheostomy is long-term mechanical ventilation. So this patient here had been on a ventilator and usually, um, you can stay on a ventilator with this tube inside your mouth for about two weeks. And then after two weeks, it gets um, like very high risk for developing pneumonia. The mouth is actually full of bacteria and it is better if a patient's gonna be intubated for greater than two weeks for them to have a tracheostomy place. And then they will be able to continue having the mechanical ventilation. All right, um, this one would be any other obstruction uh, in the upper airway. And so um, this little infant, as you see, had some kind of lymph, um, lymphatic malformation. 
and so anytime he was repositioned to be flat, his airway collapsed, and so this infant here had to have a trach. But any kind of obstruction of the airway. Okay, this is just a slide of some terminology that you may hear in the hospital. If a patient is to have a tracheotomy, this is the actual procedure to um, an incision that they're going to make. As you can see, this little slit right here, right below their voice box. And do know it is below their voice box. And that's important because patients with trache um, tracheostomies are not able to speak. They are not able to speak. And that is because the air comes in and out of this hole and it does not go through their voice box, which is probably right about here somewhere. And a tracheostomy is referred to the stoma, the actual opening. Mm. This is uh, what one actually looks like. Boy, messy scribbles, huh? There you go. That's what one looks like in a patient. Okay, so there are no standard sizes to a tracheostomy. Um, like a Foley has a standard size, like 14 French or 16 French. These don't exactly have uh, a standard size because they are all different types of shapes and angles. Uh, some are short. Um, general curvature is like 50 to 90 degrees. And it really depends if somebody has like, maybe they're morbidly obese and they have a short neck uh, versus somebody who's very tall and skinny and has a, a long neck. They are made of plastic, steel, and silicone. Some are cuffed, as you can see right here. Some are cuffed, uh, and some have no cuff. I actually don't have a cuffless one, but basically that right there is missing. Um, and the purpose of the cuff is it is supposed to be inflated on on some well some situations it's going to be inflated and it is to detour air so it actually does not pass through our vocal cords so air is going to come straight in the trach and straight down into our lungs now as a patient gets better and their situation improves we will actually do trials of deflating this cuff so it's going to get really skinny right there and during our trial we're going to see if our patient is able to breathe normally and this is really neat because what they're going to do is they deflate it and a patient now is going to breathe through the trach and it's going to come out through these little holes called fenestrations or as we like to say this is a fenestrated um, trach and it's going to come out the patient's mouth so they're actually going to uh, be able to wean themselves off their trach tube. But it's very important for a nurse to know if they have a, if they have a cuff trach or a, a non-cuff trach, and if it's a cuff trach, is the balloon supposed to be inflated or is it supposed to be deflated? That is something very specific that you need to pick up on your doctor's orders. And just to throw it out there, if your patient, it, uh, their cuff is deflated, it's actually harder for them to breathe. Only strong lungs should be able to have uh, a deflated cuff. So always ask, is my truck, my trach cuffed? Oh, it is cuffed? Okay, is the balloon inflated or deflated? Ah, that's what you need to know. Okay, um, this right here is called an inner cannula. Good. Uh, this is once again an inner cannula and it is um, usually used if somebody has excessive secretions because they are able to be changed and swapped every four to six hours. So it's called an inner cannula and its purpose is to be used for patients who have excessive secretions. <laughs> what else do I want to tell you? Okay, I'm going to show you what two other supplies are. This one right here is called an obturator. An obturator. This should be taped 
to the patient's headboard or to the wall right where they sleep and be posted at all times. I'm going to tell you its purpose in just a little bit, but it is called an obturator. Um, another thing we have to do with the trach tubes, usually the respiratory therapist will do this. They are actually going to take measurements of the balloon pressure every eight hours. So this balloon right here that you see inflated, the, in cuff, uh, the inflated cuff, there is a chance that somebody could put too much air inside there. So how much air is good? Usually about 14 to 20 millimeters of mercury. That's an average pressure of a trach tube. And you can tell by using this little manometer device. So if a patient's balloon is too high, we actually need to take some air out. And you do so by just connecting a little syringe right there. And you can remove or even add air. Okay. Let's see, the next thing I want to talk to you about is these little special valves. They are very important. These are called passy mirror valves. Passy mirror valves. That's M U I R, mirror. These are one way valves that are going to attach to the end of a, um, of a trach and they are gonna allow air, when the patient breathes in, air is going to suck in through this valve, down to the lungs, and when they begin to speak, the valve is actually going to shut off, it's a one-way valve, and air is then gonna go straight on up, right up to the patient's vocal cords, which are right here. So, this is what we call a speaking valve, or a speaker valve. But a patient, if you ever are uh, taking care of them, sometimes they will go to sleep with this thing. It needs to be taken off, and there is going to be a little container at bedside. It kind of looks like one for dentures, but you're going to put it in there. Um, if you ever find one in a patient's sheets, do not toss it. It is not some random bottle cap. This is a very expensive, highly <laughs> sought-after valve. So hang on to that speaker valve. It's really critical that it is well cared for. You can usually rinse it with water if it has a lot of mucus on them. Um, occasionally a patient, I had this one patient who had excessive coughing and I immediately went to him and I took off his speaker valve. It just kind of like kind of pulls off like a cap, but I, I took it off and he, you could even hear him. He go, <gasps> so Patients actually need to have strong lungs to be able to wear the speaker valve and they usually have to uh, work themselves up to it where like they will, a speech therapist will work with them. They'll wear it like for one hour a day for a week and then they can move up to wearing it like two hours a day, three hours a day until they can eventually get to the point where they can wear it 24, no, not 24 <laughs> seven. Um, they can wear it most of the day. But yep, it's called a speaker valve or passing mirror valve. So fancy. So some other do's and don'ts for a patient who has a tracheostomy would be to assess and make sure that the trach is facing midline. So follow the patient's chin and go on down. It should be looking at the direction where they are and not pointing down, which would indicate that it is dislodged. We should make sure that two fingers can slide under the knots on both sides. You can actually tie one too tight. So make sure there is two finger space on both sides. Um, our patient here doesn't have one, but make sure we have a split gauze, which is under the face plate of the collar. This is actually the face plate, this big white plastic piece where our trick collar is going to attach to. So make sure there's a split gauze. It should be changed pretty frequently. If um, you notice that your patient has excessive secretions, you may be changing it every hour. I know, every hour. <clears throat> um, if a patient has the ability to eat, this person is 100% of an aspiration risk. 
Think about it. All of their muscles needed for chewing and swallowing are sort of anchored down. That is not going to make for effective swallowing um, movements for your patient. So to compensate for that, we have to sit them upright 90 degrees. And when they swallow, they need to tuck their chin down to their chest. We may have to do some diet modifications such as no thin liquids. Um, and once again, it's because our trach is tethered down or our trach is tethering down their muscles and they cannot lift. Uh, we also want to encourage our patient to dry swallow after each bite to make sure all of the food is down. We do want to avoid consecutive swallows when they're drinking liquids. So like gulp, 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 gulp. They need to like drink and pause, drink and pause. Okay, uh, this right here, that check the pressure often, we, I have this little picture here. This nurse is actually checking the pressure with her manometer, making sure it's 14 to 20 millimeters of mercury. And this patient's cuff is actually inflated, meaning air should only be coming in here and straight down to her lungs. So the nurse is actually assessing and making sure that air is not coming up through her mouth and that the cuff is properly inflated. This is like a double check, I like it. If she hears something, that means air is coming through the patient's mouth and not just down into her lungs, she may have to readjust and put more air into that cuff. Okay, so common complications. Well, accidental decannulation. I have some slides where I'm gonna talk about that next and same for mucus plugs and infection. Um, so when it comes to trach care to prevent infection, you are gonna need a trach kit. And this is usually done once or twice a shift. It may be done more frequently if our patient has um, excessive secretions, but this is a sterile procedure. I have to repeat that. This is a sterile procedure. You are going to clean the site with half peroxide and half saline, or some facilities just use saline only. You, once you're sterile, you use a circular motion starting at the center of the stoma and you just kind of clean around it moving outward. Um, you are going to change the trach ties when they are soiled and then you have to apply the new ones and then you take off the old ones. Let me actually point this out right here. There's actually two people doing this here, but one person is holding and supporting the trach. There is nothing worse than you trying to do trach care and you have the tie, like one tie undone because you're switching it around and then this patient coughs. <laughs> and if you do not have this counter pressure from this person here, that trach is gonna fly across the bed. So. Make sure you apply the new ones and then after it's secure, take the old ones off under it. It's kind of like getting your clothes on at the beach with a towel. You're like sort of why one is currently, yeah, well, we're not going to worry about that. Okay, keep moving on. Uh, you're going to keep the following at bedside at all time. You're going to keep two extra tracheostomy tubes, like just two boxes of the same size, the same type, and you're going to keep them at bedside. Um, you are going to keep this, um, I have lost my mind. What is the name of this? It's a BVM. I think it's a bivalve mask. Lord help me. But you're going to keep this at all times hanging on the wall. Why? Because there might be a patient who has a mucus plug and you're going to need to manually ventilate them. And that's uh, kind of a scary situation, but this needs to be in the room with you at all times. Um, <clears throat> and to go back about having those two tracheostomy tubes, you're going to have one that's the client size and one that's a little bit smaller just in case of accidental decannulation. Sometimes it's easier to put in the smaller one. And I'll talk about decannulation on our next slide. 
another thing we need to have at all times is a suction source. So there probably needs to be um, a suction canister, the regulator, the tubing, and it needs to be connected probably to a yonker, or some people say yonkower. Tomato, tomato. All right, let's pretend that you are a graduate nurse and you just got your new job and you're off orientation and you walk into your trach patient's room and you see this. Yes, this is decannulation. So now what are you gonna do? Well, if it is a patient who has recently um, had a tracheostomy place, like less than 72 hours, you are actually going to bag their face. Yes. If they have only had their trach for a few days, I want you to bag their face and shout for help. Now, if they have had a trach for greater than three days, oftentimes the stoma will be partially open. And if this is the case, we are going to put the trach back in. We are going to hyperextend the neck. We're gonna use that obturator that I mentioned and the obturator will then assist us to put the trach back in. We're going to secure the trach and then listen to breast sounds. All right, let's walk through that process. So our patient has a little bit of an open stoma. It's been say seven days that they've had their trach. And if you can see this, you're going to take option C or the, the device C, and you're going to insert C into B, as in boy. So C goes into B, and if you can look at that picture, you're gonna hold it like you would a golf tee, like if you're putting a golf tee in the ground. So as you're holding it like that, that rounded tip on the obturator, which is that picture in C, is going to sort of, uh, allow for ease of insertion into that person's stoma. Okay, so this is actually that picture again, and I really like how this is done, because on this bottom right picture right here, you can see that the nurse is inserting it just into the patient's stoma, and I want you to notice the angle that they're putting this in at. It's actually, not a midline straight shot. They're putting it in sideways. Let me show you a reinsertion technique that is done incorrectly. Can you see that? This is not how we want it done. You need to hold it like a golf tee and you need to put it sideways into your patient. Kind of like this angle. Let's see if I can draw it. Eh. Maybe not so good, like kind of like 45 degrees. Yeah, that's good. 45 degrees is how you want to put that in. This one right here is 45 degrees. Good. So that's how you're going to reinsert with the obturator, which is going to make that blunt tip um, and it's going to slide right on in and the patient will be able to breathe as soon as you remove now the obturator, the obturator is actually blocking the airway. So you're going to remove the obturator and connect your bivalve mask. There you go. And your patient's gonna say, oh, thank you so much. All right, so that's how you're going to um, act. And that's what you're going to do if a patient has an accidental decannulation. All right. Our next complication we need to learn how to mitigate is mucus plugs. Ah, uh, mucus plugs. So your uh, typical air humidification to your lungs is done through your nose and through your mouth. However, our patients who have trachs, the air is bypassing that wonderful system that we have, and it is just going dry into our lungs. Well, this is not good because our body is constantly producing mucus and a trach patient will produce a lot of mucus and the airways will get super dry and sticky and dry sticky mucus does not allow air to pass around it. In fact, um, a mucus plug will form. These are not good. 
and you know your patient has one if they are um, having increased respiratory distress and you're suctioning and it's just not helping um, this is actually something where I would use the bivalve mask if my if I suspect my person has a mucus plug anyway um, this right here is an aerosol trach mask they call it a ATM aerosol trach mask do, 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 do. oh yeah I'm gonna do it oh that's bad okay yep maybe I should stop no there we go okay it's called an ATM or aerosol trach mask and this is going to provide our patient humidified air now um, half the time when I walk in you know what patients do with these little things they take it and they move it they either loosen the ties so much like they'll uh, loosen the ties right here they'll loosen it so much so it's like hanging down on their chest or the patients will move it to the side so the aerosol trach mask is actually like humidifying their ear <laughs> So that's not exactly beneficial. So please take a moment and make sure your aerosol trach mask is midline and it is, you know, basically kissing the trach. That is the best thing. Ah, one more tidbit. Your patient, when they cough, a lot of times they will be coughing and you will need to assess and to clean out all of this mucus that is caught in here. This can get very nasty and can be a breeding ground for infection, especially as your patient's trying to um, breathe in through this thing. So take a wipe and wipe it off. Your person will probably be just fine if you take it off for you know a minute or so. Um, get it clean and then replace it back on your patient. Now, what does the humidification system look like? that looks like this and if you actually notice on the side here these special numbers Let's see. Da, 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 da. yep when we get report on a patient as a trach they'll say they're on five liters atm which is 28 percent so that basically means that we can adjust how much oxygen a patient is getting and we can adjust like here doo, 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 doo. we can adjust how much oxygen the patient is getting and this is really nice because it will give us the percent of oxygen that they are on just like if we were doing a nasal cannula you guys know how much nasal cannula oxygen gives so anyway it's important to know when you get report on a patient that has a trach how much oxygen are they being delivered now this needs to be full of fluid. Do you know what kind of fluid would you use? Normal saline or would you use sterile water? Mm -hmm. The answer is sterile water. That should be poured in there. But not to worry, this is actually typically what we see in the hospital. You will see a bottle that is something you can grab from the supply and you will see this um, applicator piece and the two actually go together. So this is what you're gonna commonly see in the hospital. This spike right here that you see, the spike is going to drive into the front and I guess you can't really see it. There's a spike inside here and that spike actually goes on top here. So you have two areas to spike, don't confuse the two. They're in there. Oh, this is what it looks like when it is all connected and put together. Nice, huh? That's what it looks like in the end. All right, suctioning. Suctioning is extremely important because it maintains a patent airway. It promotes gas exchange. Um, and patients who, not cough, who cannot cough very effectively, we're going to be suctioning more frequently. Now, how are we going to do this? Once again, remember this is a sterile procedure. Uh, so you're going to get a sterile hand and you are going to, with your non-sterile hand, you actually have one sterile glove and one non-sterile glove on, um, but you are going to hyper oxygenate them. You're going to put this ATM right over them and you're going to turn up that dial to deliver 100% oxygen to them. And you're going to ask them to take three to five breaths of real good 
high concentration of oxygen. They're going to get their SATs up and you're going to monitor their heart rate if they're on a continuous monitor. Because remember, um, hypoxia is going to show up if we are suctioning too much. Um, let them know that um, if they are developing too much, uh, like an intolerance to your procedure, to give you like a hand signal or something. Um, and you do want to stop if their SATs drop below 90%, if they come cyanotic, or if they lose consciousness, or if their heart rate spikes too high. All right, uh, that being said, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and suction them. So um, we are going to suction for 10 to 15 seconds at a time. So what that means is you're going to hyperoxygenate, you're going to pull the trach mass to the side and you're going to stick this little tube down there and you're going to hit the bottom of their lungs. You'll actually feel it smack. <laughs> Smack's not the word. You actually feel it like hit resistance and whenever you hit that resistance, that's your starting point. A lot of times I will count out loud, one, two, three, four, like I will actually even tell my patients we're going to do this for 10 seconds. I will count to 10 or I will even hold my breath so I know how long, say, a typical, typical breath hold will be. But do count 10 to 15 seconds. You can do up to three passes max, one, two, three. Ooh, what happens if I do three passes and my patient is still needing, like they're still coughing, they're still producing mucus, and then you go down again. You're gonna start from the very beginning. You're gonna hyperoxygenate, uh, ask them to take three to five good breaths, and then you're gonna go and do it again three times each. And then afterwards, please hyperoxygenate after you're all said and done. It's really interesting. Patients uh, who have trachs, they'll actually will tell you They'll say one more time or no more, don't even do again. Um, so they are very in tune with their body if they feel like there's something down there and they need you to get it. Um, let's see, some complications that can arise from this would be ineffective oxygenation before and after suctioning. Um, using a catheter that is too large for the artificial airway, so make sure um, you're not shoving it down. It should easily glide down. And um, another complication is prolonged suctioning time. Definitely don't want to suction for too long. Remember, you got 10 to 15 seconds. Get down there and get out. Excessive suction pressure. Um, the pressure on the um, suction machine should read anywhere from 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. 80 to 100. No more than that. Another complication is too frequent suctioning. We can actually introduce more bacteria unnecessarily and we can traumatize the airway more than necessary. So um, how often do you suction a patient? Mm -hmm. I usually find that I suction them every hour or every two hours. I'm not sure if I clicked too fast and it cut me off, but I said I suction every two hours minimum for our patients. All right. Bronchial and oral hygiene, we are going to uh, support our patient moving, get them turning, reposition them. Patients who are, have trachs often will get bed sores just from sitting in the same spot for too long. We want them to be active, support out of bed activities. Anytime they need to, you know, uh, say they need to be out of bed three times a day, set a timer for them so they have um, something to go by. Encourage early ambulation. Get them out of bed, walking down the hall uh, as best as possible. <clears throat> uh, encourage coughing and deep breathing. Chest percussions. Can a um, nurse do this or can a respiratory or does it have to be done by a respiratory therapist? Answer is both. You just cup your hand and you're going to do like seek, uh, walk, like frequent pats, kind of like and it's gonna get it up pretty good. I apologize if that was excessively loud. Okay, and this is actually some patterns of where to percuss. Shoulders, chest, front, and this is awesome to turn them over and to percuss their back and allow for postural drainage. <clears throat> Supports pulmonary hygiene, as we say. All right, mouth care. 
their mouth, because they're not breathing through there, um, can often get dry. Um, do assess for ulcers. Do assess for bacterial and fungal growth, thrush, other infections that may be in there. Do avoid glycerin swabs or other mouthwash care products that contain alcohol. That is a no-go.